Welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle, the co-host and your head witch in charge here at Holisticism. I started Holisticism to help creative, intuitive, spiritual people actualize through their sacred work. And at the 12th House, that's what we talk about all day long. We give you tools to do whatever it is that you're here to do. So join us twice a week to talk about everything you could possibly need to get the expansion pack and jump to the next level. I think you're going to love it. Make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast and let's get into today's episode. Hi, Wallace. Hi, Michelle. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Love a Friday. I'm excited for today's episode. Yeah, because I'm surprising you. I have no idea what we're talking about. And you know what? I don't think you ever would have guessed this because I don't really think this is like in my persona, but it is and it isn't. So let me get to it. Today, I want to talk to you about identifying magical ideas through the framework of the Disney strategy. Oh my God. Obsessed. <laughs> like Disney princess strategy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your connotation with Disney? Because I think we all have some probably like complicated history with Disney. My association with magical moments in Disney, basically they're like, okay, get pretty, find husband, do it no matter what, even if you have to die and get reborn. <laughs> yeah. Get pretty, find rich husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To be fair, I do think that you have beef with the original fairy tales that the Disney they tried to move beyond that. Yeah, though, they, and they recently have. they've moved in different directions, but that is totally fair. That was what they were amplifying the messages they were amplifying for a very long time. I will admit, I don't have a Disney Plus membership, and I have heard through the grapevine there's a lot of great new content, and I am not up to date, so clearly I have some work to do. I don't have a Disney Plus membership either. We had it for a little while, then we canceled it because it just wasn't for us. But People love the Star Wars show, which I'm love- into the Star Wars franchise. We watched them. It was, it was great, and then we didn't mm. really have anything else to watch. But that's a subject for a tangent a streaming tangent for another day. I wanted to do this because we, I think we really take for granted like the genius of Walt Disney and what Dis- the behemoth company that Disney has become. And I mean, I grew up in Orange County and so pretty close to the original Disneyland and the original lot parking lot. I remember going to the original Disney parking lot, the one from the fifties my parents have memories of going to Disneyland and like you had to pay, you got these tickets and different tickets would get you on different rides, like a $5 ticket or a 50 cent ticket versus a five cent ticket. And also just Disney as like a giant conglomerate, the Disney vault, like Imagineers, all everything that Disney has done over the the past, past decades. I think I take it for granted. I won't speak for everyone. And Walt Disney problematic, which we know, We're not going to go into that as much, but obviously a genius creative person as well as a business genius, because to have the foresight that he did to buy the land that he built Disney World and Disneyland on is pretty impressive. And also to have this business that continues today, you have to have a strong foundation. But the Disney strategy is based on Walt Disney's approach to creative and critical thinking. And We obviously know that he's pretty good at both of those things. Say what you will about his personal life and his personal beliefs. And the Disney strategy involves three different roles and three different ways of thinking. Each comes with a unique mindset, the dreamer, the realist, and the critic. And this strategy wasn't like trademarked by Walt Disney. It was actually observed and then modeled out by two neuro-linguistic programming experts, Robert Diltz and Todd Epstein in the 90s. They basically studied Disney's creative process. They interviewed his staff and his team, people who had worked with him, and then they found the pattern in the way, in his style of working and created a framework out of it. And why it's interesting is because Walt Disney has this unique ability to be a genius, visionary, creative thinker, as well as a really dialed pragmatist who can get things done. And Wallace, you've worked with artists. 
do they tend to be great at to-do lists and admin and strategy and things like, I don't know, talking to the city of Anaheim to negotiate a lower rate for rent? Mm, no, I, it's interesting to distinguish also, to your point, the rarity around having that much creative genius and the ability to execute on this like business marketing side of things, because often really great artists have to be single focused in order to be the great artists that they are, just mm -hmm. like craftsmanship. So I hear you. So well said. And we have our judgments around capitalism. Yeah. But for someone who is like a pretty prolific artist and creator to also have a pretty keen understanding and grasp of capitalism and consumerism and what people want while also wanting to leave people with a magical life changing experience, not just I want to suck as much money out of them as I can, I think is rare. So. Walt Disney is known for his ability to turn his dreams into these crazy successful real life projects and not over a hundred years, over two years, three years to take something from just a little seed of an idea to something huge, groundbreaking, world changing. And the process is bro broken down, like you said, into three different ways of thinking. And you basically cycle through these ways of thinking in order to work through the project or the problem and progress it on along each stage. So the first stage is the dreamer. This is about imagining as many possibilities as you can without constraints. We've also talked about the 11 star experience, and we actually should write that down maybe as like a framework to do, but we've alluded to the 11 star experience here. And that's basically the dreamer, like how big can we go? Because we like, I don't know, we're trained as people in the world to automatically critique ourselves and not allow ourselves to dream big. So we sometimes run into a block or a roadblock, or we actually have to think really hard to expand what could be possible. What if we had 10 million, a hundred million, a billion dollars to execute on this project? What could we do? What would we do? And that means that we have to think about what any idea, regardless of how impractical it can be. And that's really hard. That's really hard for us because we're constantly thinking, can I do this? And the truth is in the dreaming stage, no, <laughs> you can't, you probably can't do it, but it's not your job to figure that out quite yet. We'll get there. You want to let your imagination run wild. And that's what Disney was really good at doing. He was amazing at imagining something that didn't exist in the world yet, having zero boundaries around it, thinking about what could be possible. What if I don't know, we created this magical land and we named different lands everywhere and we created the happiest place on earth. What if we created the place, God on the map, where pe the most people are happy per capita? How could we possibly do that? That's not my business. I just want to like dream, dream up. How can we make the happiest place on earth? So you got to let your imagination run wild as a dreamer. The next step is the realist. And here's where you switch to a practical mindset. The, okay. Let's think about how we could actually do that. You analyze the ideas that you created in the dreamer stage and you figure out, okay, how could this happen? Not, or am I going to be able to make this happen? But if we wanted to do this, how would we do it? What's possible? Even if it's, okay, we have to get permission from the president of the United States to have this land. Great. Okay. You're just laying out the steps to get to the thing that you want to do. Disney would shift from his dreamer stage into his practical mindset. And that involves things like logistics, resources, the steps that need to be taken to get, bring your creative vision to life. And then finally we have the critic, which I would say most of us live in the critic. We are in this room or this box. And at this stage, this obviously where you identify potential problems or weaknesses in your plan, you stress test your plan. And you want to look for things that could be wrong or that could be improved. We're not just shooting things down <laughs> because we're being mean. We are trying to create the most bulletproof, the most bulletproof project or vision that we're going to be able to end up executing on and hopefully not fail while we're doing. Walt Disney would do that. He would think about this as the essential final stage for the product to make sure it's as high of quality as possible. And also that if he can't make it as high quality as he needs it to be, then it's time to scrap it. 
Without dreamers, the realist has nothing to do, that middle stage. Without realists, the dreamers' ideas will never leave their heads. And without critics, the dreamers' and the realists' work will always be half-baked and unpolished. It will never be totally complete. And you can think of these three identities in yourself, like internal family systems. You can also think of them as overlapping Venn diagrams. Or you can think of them as rooms. And this is actually what Walt Disney would do. He would create a room and he would say, okay, he wouldn't say this is our visionary room, but he would say for the time being, or dreamer room, for the time being, all we're going to do is vision. And that would be the dreamer room. So all that they would do in that room is come up with concepts and no, no feedback. No, that's stupid. No, that's impossible. Just ideas. They'd sit on it for a little bit and then he'd create a new room. They would literally go to a new space and they would become the realists. That's cool that they move. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's really cool. And he did this intuitively. He just knew, okay, we're going to need to like shake up the way that we do this. So for the dreamer stage or the dreamer room, like the idea is in the middle. The ideas are in the middle, for, uh, I should say. That's where they're pushed. It's not about it's not about the people in the room and elevating themselves. It's all about just building upon more dreams and ideas. And then the next stage is the realist room. And here's where you consider what needs to happen to make a reality. So the idea is a little bit on trial. And then finally, the critic room is where the idea is definitely on trial, not the people who came up with the idea, just the idea. That's what we're criticizing or we're looking for like chinks in the armor. Strengths and weaknesses are looked up and at in a in detail. It's where the idea is criticized, it's taken to trial, and it's really stress tested. So each of these rooms, Disney would create and they'd go through for every single project that they ended up making. Cool, right? Yeah. One of the things I've been thinking about this whole time is that innately some people will embody one more easily than the other. And who's on this team? And who does he keep around him for each of these phases? Because I'm assuming he has people who are really different thinkers than him in all of these rooms. And I think that's, it's like that tension between the people who are disagreeing and trying to sway each other in different directions is what creates that kind of magic, but can also be Mm -hmm. tricky and tough. And so I was thinking, one, what is his human design? Two, what is his Enneagram? And three, who is the (laughs) team that is made up of this? Really the rubric though. And I also like, the idea of changing your setting and just how important that is for moving along into a different phase of thinking and generating different or stimulating different senses. It says here that Disney was an eight. Disney was an eight with a nine wing. I don't know if you can like properly type someone who is not alive, but interesting. Yeah. I think that you're, you're poking at something that we could all take away though, which is when there are certain people that you tell your ideas to at different stages. Like I can't, for example, I love my husband, but I'm not going to tell him my like crazy dream ideas all the time because he immediately goes into, how could you do that? Is that possible? Or how can we do it? Who do we need to talk to? Which is awesome because he's like trying to help me make it happen. He's not a critic. He's a realist, but sometimes I just need him to be like, that's a really cool idea. And wow big. I feel like partners are tricky, right? Because your your lives are so entwined. Immediately, it feels like you're just a dream killer. That's how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I'm never telling you again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Family, for sure. Parents, too, I think, can sometimes do this for their kids. Or even, mm-hmm. like, certain friends. Like, there are some friends who I'm going to go to when I'm really excited about something. And also, there are other people, sometimes, like, When you're in the dreamer stage, you shouldn't talk to anyone about it. Amen. I think as a creator, knowing where your groups of people are, who are your dreamers, who are your realists, who are your critics, because you need all of them. If you only have yes people in your life, dreamers and maybe realists, but no one who's actually going to critique your idea, then that's actually cruel. (laughs) Yeah, it's a disservice to everybody. If you are the yes person, because perhaps you're not always being honest or on the receiving end, it's not helpful. Sometimes I've had people even say to me or I've said to people, what feedback would be helpful at this stage? Because Mm -hmm. I feel so conscious of being on the receiving end of sharing something and then people being like, "Mm, that's not going to work. And so 
I, I will definitely say, okay, what at this stage is the most helpful feedback? Because usually people will be specific with you if you don't know like where you stand in that kind of, in the triangle of this system. Yeah, that's a good point. Just asking, what do you, what do you want out of this? exchange or knowing your human design do you want my advice or do you want Mm -hmm. me to affirm you or yeah what are you open to can save your relationships what do you feel like is different about this philosophy than some of your own practices for dreaming manifesting creation like that stands out as something that would be different for you to try I think that I often lump together the realist and the critic. I think of it as a binary, like dreamer over here, like wild and crazy, sky's the limit versus like practical, let me put my glasses on and crunch the numbers type of person or like strategy or tactic that I'm taking. And I really like that middle ground of the realist who all that they are supposed to do is break down the steps. Okay, here's how we could do that thing. Not and it's impossible, or it's going to be really fucking hard. No commentary, just, okay, if we want to raise $100 million, then we have to talk to a 1,000 investors. That's what we're going to have to do. And I think I, like, bypass that step often when I'm putting my own projects, like, considering my own projects or projects for holisticism. But I think we're really good at, like, the dreamer stage for the most part. Maybe too good sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Maybe egg each other on too much. Yeah, a little bit. (laughs) What about you? Yeah, what I like about the labels or the names of the critic and the realist. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that they're both there for constructive criticism. The critic is there to refine and massage and improve the overall execution, it seems like. The realist Mm -hmm. is there to break it down from a project management perspective of how do we actually break this down into steps and move forward. Yeah. And so none of them ideally are people who are or energies or whatever that are negative and not helpful and destructive. They're all serving Mm -hmm. a specific constructive role within the project, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's really well said. The realist is, I th- the get it done, right? And the critic is the let's make it really good. And I I don't know if I can speak for c- creative people in general, but I know for myself as someone with ADHD who's definitely a perfectionist, I won't even say recovering perfectionist because I think you are, you just are. You have a better handle on your mental and internal voice and that you don't like ever become a recovering perfectionist, I don't think. But as a perfectionist, I often find myself waffling between I'm just going to do it really shitty and put it up or I have to make it perfect. And that binary, that black or white thinking, we talked about this with our 15 styles of distorted thinking, like it comes into play a lot around quality for me. And I think that a really good critic is not it's not, oh, it has to be perfect. This has to be a five-star meal. This needs to be 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. A movie can still be like 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, and that's very good. And it can have flaws and still be worth publishing, worth putting out to the world. Yeah, I actually also am really enjoying the expanded definition of a critic because I feel like my association subconsciously is normally the critic in the New York Times or the New Yorker where they're not part of the project. They serve a cultural purpose. And critics are important, even if they can be frustrated. But this critic is directly involved in the project and in a phase of the project. And I think having an internal role as also a perfectionist, you have to really let go of some of that when you're working with other people. It's easier to be a perfectionist when either you're working on your own on something or you have total veto power and control but often working in groups you have to make compromises you have to work together and so I think it's nice to have this other version of the critic because no one in that situation can necessarily hold on to the entire reins if everyone is working collaboratively totally and the critic like internal critic serves this purpose of listen do you want to show your whole ass when you publish this thing and be really fucking embarrassed because you didn't poke all the holes in it and like really consider it? 
Or do you want to like go through the pain now of being a little bit butthurt that you're getting some feedback and you're going to have to change some stuff, but it'll lead to such a better like final product. That's true. So to be a dreamer, five points. Give yourself 15 minutes to just freely describe dream time. If everything is possible without restrictions, without pressure, how do you describe your vision, your career, your business, your life, what you want to do, the product, the project, what will give you passion and what will make you feel happy? Important. And if your dreams came true, what will you see and what will you gain in your life? Try to imagine in your mind how your life would be if your dreams came true. What would it feel like? What would it look like? And again, don't be like, that's impossible or that I could never do that. Yeah, this is the dreamer stage, baby. Don't hold back. Okay, to be a realist, a couple things to think about. Can you take 20 minutes to just come up with a really rough bulleted plan? Like just brain dump all, you can use goblin.tools for this, brain dump everything that you think you're going to have to do, and you can always reorganize it later, but just take 20 minutes to brain dump all the things. And who might you need, think about who you might need to implement, what's going to need to happen to implement these things, who do you need on your team, where are you going to need help, where are you going to need advice, what needs to get done today, what needs to get done tomorrow, what needs to get done next week, and what needs to get done in a month in order to make this thing happen. And what resources do you have? Like we're talking about financial resources, but also other resources like people resources, your own creative resources, et cetera. And how can you get more resources to get a wider platform or to, to meet the dream, to come a little bit closer to the dream, the like ideal? Okay. And finally, how to be a critic for yourself. Give yourself just five minutes, put a little timer on and pretend that you're finding all of the flaws. Like, Pretend that you are the person who's supposed to test the submersible before it goes down into the Titanic. <laughs> you don't want there to be any, anything, any little holes. You got to be like really strict about it, but just for this five minutes and don't hold back. Then do a little gut check. How do I feel about this? Is this the best I can really do? Is my best possible? What is my best right now? What is the definition of doing my best right now? And is it possible for me to make this better? Can I really make it so much better that it completely changes the way that I put out this product or project? Or am I just making it marginally better in a way that no one is really going to notice and I'm just procrastinating and kicking the can down the road? How is this going to look like to a customer or a client or an expert or someone who I really admire and respect? What are they going to think about this? What holes might they poke in my theories or the thing that I've created? And then is it actually worth it to improve this product or this project or actually do I need to scrap the whole thing? Is it worth publishing? Probably yes. It's probably worth it. The critic is about improving, not totally discarding. Yes. And moving things forward. Like critics move things forward to the next stage. They're not blockers. They're the like shit or get off the pot person on the team. What's the one weird thing about the Disney philosophy for dreaming? Mm, I think that the one weird thing is that Disney created this framework for himself and didn't write it down, but just innately did it. And I think that's very fucking cool, but also weird because for someone who's so good at seeing patterns and understanding people, you would think that he would write down his own creative process and clock it. That is interesting. I'm just going to look. Yeah. Yeah. On the P to V Pisces to Virgo scale, where does it fall? It feels Aquarian to me. Because it's like creative, but also measured, intellectual, sort of out there, like sky's the limit. That's very Aquarius to me. So I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I don't know if Sagittarius would also make sense in terms of. I was going to say Sag too. I was thinking that in my brain. Yeah. Now that you thought it, go and get it. Go do it. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. It's got that fire. It brings that fire energy, which you Mm -hmm. need. Matcha or coffee? (laughs) I think it's, I think it's a matcha latte. Yeah, for sure. I just think it needs foam. <laughs> it needs to have a little bit of pleasure. You can't just be dry. You can't be happy without a little froth, as we discussed. It's true. Do you think this is a morning glory or a night owl? Morning glory, except for if there's a big deadline. Also a night owl. An all-nighter, if you will. Okay, see, it was giving me it's giving night owl to me, because anytime I picture people in a room, I'm like, oh, they're all there at night. I don't know why. I'm <laughs> just like, the you I think that's true of cartoonists, so you might be correct. That's also true of architects Mm -hmm. and designers to a degree. Like a lot of the Imagineers were different designers from different Mm -hmm. fields. Okay, cool. 
Are we missing any other ones? Oh, you know what we didn't do? Archetype Sun, Moon, and Rising. This one's easy. It's got to be a Sun, Dreamer Sun, and then a Realist Rising, and a Critic Moon. Perfect. Is there a message here? (laughs) Or what? (laughs) We need all three. Okay. You need them all. Are you an acolyte? Um, I think I would join the cult, this Mm -hmm. cult of Disney thinking. I think it would be cool to work in a place like this. I don't think it would be cool to work at Disneyland or necessarily for Walt Disney, but I do think this like way of putting ideas together and coming up with them is it, it creates a more free creative environment where people feel safe, I think. And that's where the best ideas are born when people feel, when people aren't afraid and there's more like equality in the room or it feels more like there's more quality. What about you? Would you be an acolyte? At first I was going to say no. I started off on the defensive, clearly. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like this is very logical and I see a lot of similarities to things that we already do. And I appreciate bringing the critic like into the fold. That yeah. would be my biggest takeaway. So not no is my answer. Yeah. This framework really reminds me of internal family systems and like Mm -hmm. befriending and trying to understand what each character or archetype in your internal family system is there for and not villainizing or totally trying to get rid of a voice in your head. Just like acknowledging that it's there and that it's doing a job and sometimes that job is helpful and sometimes it's not. It just needs to be applied at the right stage. I think there's something to be said for the creative genius within all of us and what it takes to let that out because we're conditioned for the realist and the critic to override that. I think with most messages Mm -hmm. in society, it's no wonder that's where we all need a little bit more encouragement. It's true. This is, I I know that Disney is not everyone's favorite thing, but I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope it opened up your mind a little bit and we can take away the like, negative connotation we can divorce the negative connotations with disney and just take the framework like we said many times we try to operate in the gray area we're not saying disney has done no wrong or that he's done nothing that he's a terrible person we're not saying any of that we're not saying that don't put those words in my mouth because that's not what i said also i (laughs) had never been to disney until i went with my three-year-old nephew and the magic is alive and real especially seeing it through a kid's eyes. I can't hate. What a contribution. Yeah. I have some very fond memories of going to Disneyland with my parents and my sister. It's a good, it could be a good place. We all need to be kids again, so that I stand with. Okay, go dream, guys. We'll leave you with that. Yeah, go have fun. Thanks for listening. If you liked this episode, if you got anything out of it, if you love Disneyland or don't if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts that would be amazing or you can leave us five stars on Spotify it's super easy and it helps us get found and discovered by other people and then the more people that listen the more podcast episodes we can make blah 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 everyone's happier we appreciate it one more thing if you like this and you want even more every month we release an episode that is a little mini audio course and it's only $5.99 a month now less than a latte in most major metropolitan areas so come join us it's really fun it's like the green room it's a special place to be and a great way to support podcasters like us so we can keep these things ad free we will see you next week all right bye bye